So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello, this is Robin Norgren, and I am your host for Creativity, Montessori, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on Instagram under at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for Life. I'd like to start with some words from Awaken by Priscilla Shearer. Ephesians 4.32 Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. The pony had once been part of a circus act, relegated to walking in circles day after day, year after year, doing whatever his handlers required of him. But after being retired from the traveling show, his new home became a lush, spacious pasture out in the country, abounding in opportunity for exploration and discovery. Yet even in his new-found place of freedom, he couldn't seem to escape his whole pattern of life. He still continued walking, walking mostly in circles, round and round, day in and day out, apparently not knowing any other way to operate. These circles represent the burden of unforgiveness, how it defines us, restrains us, controls us, until over time it becomes our legacy our pattern of living, the first thing others notice about us. Though surrounded on all sides by the new spaces that each season of life brings, unforgiveness forces us to travel and stay rutted, one-dimensional, thinly sliced, unable to experience the joys and freedoms that exist beyond the periphery of our closely guarded pain. It fits us with blinders, keeping us relegated to memories of the offenses done against us, to the artificial boundaries created by yesterday's disappointments, a circle of mundane, cheerless living that's far beneath the abundant life we've been created to enjoy. Always those circles. Nothing but circles. Please, God, no more circles. I realize it's hard to forgive, sometimes painfully hard. Perhaps, though, you've seen the pointlessness of it, the regressive nature of it, and you've tried to forgive. You've genuinely thought you were there. You felt like you were branching out beyond where the memories had held you for so long. But then here it came again. Another betrayal. Another broken promise. Another blow to your fragile trust. And as a result, deeper hurt, closed loops, tighter circles. But God wants you released from the self-imposed bondage. His word exhorts each of us to tear up the ongoing record of others' wrongdoing. Same as he did with us when he erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us. He now invites you to unload all the responsibility you may feel for enforcing justice on others, leaving room for the wrath of God, leaving the job to one who can more wisely deal with it. Forgiveness is certainly a miracle, a supernatural outworking of God's Spirit within you, enabling you to extend something to the people in your life that you could never do otherwise. But when, by his help, you choose to forgive, he will remove you from your old ruts of walking space, setting you free to breathe the fresh air of his goodness. He will change the geometry of your life from endless circles into the best shape your heart has ever 
been before. Austin Kleon says in his book, Steal Like an Artist, the secret is do good work and share it with people. In the beginning, obscurity is good. I get a lot of emails from young people who ask, how did I get discovered? I sympathize with them. There is a kind of fallout that happens when you leave college. The classroom is a wonderful, if artificial, place. Your professor gets paid to pay attention to your ideas, and your classmates are paying to pay attention to your ideas. Never again in your life will you have such a captive audience. Soon after, you learn that most of the world doesn't necessarily care about what you think. It sounds harsh, but it's true. As the writer Stephen Pressfield says, it's not that people are mean or cruel, they're just busy. This is actually a good thing because you want attention only after you're doing really good work. There's no pressure when you're unknown. You can do what you want, experiment, do things just for the fun of it. When you're unknown, there's nothing to distract you from getting better. No public image to manage. No huge paycheck on the line. No stockholders, no emails from your agent, no hangers on. You'll never get that freedom back again once people start paying you attention, and especially not once they start paying you money. Enjoy your obscurity while it lasts and use it. If there was a secret formula for becoming known, I would give it to you. But there's only one not so secret formula that I know. Do good work and share it with people. It's a two-step process. Step one, do good work. And that's incredibly hard. There are no shortcuts. Make stuff every day. Know you're going to suck at it for a while. Fail get better. Step two, share it with people with really hard up, was really hard up until about 10 years ago. Now it's very simple. Just put your stuff on the internet. I tell people this and then they ask, what's the secret of the internet? Step one, wonder at something. Step two, invite others to wander with you. You should wonder at the things nobody else is wondering about. If everybody's wondering about apples, go wonder about oranges. The more open you are to sharing your passions, the closer people will feel to your work. Artists aren't mus magicians. There's no penalty for revealing your secrets. Believe it or not, I get a lot of inspiration from people like Bob Ross and Martha Stewart. Remember Bob Ross? The painter on PBS with the fro and the happy little trees? Bob Ross taught people how to paint. He gave his secrets away. Martha Stewart teaches you how to make your home and your life awesome. She gives her secrets away. People love it when you give your secrets away. And sometimes, if you're smart about it, they'll reward you by buying the things you're selling. When you open up your process and invite people in, you learn. I've learned so much from the folks who submit poems to my newspaper blackout site. I find a lot of things to steal, too. too. It, def it benefits me as much as it does them. You don't put yourself online only because you have something to say. You can put yourself online to find something to say. The Internet can be more than just a resting place to publish your finished ideas. It can also be an incubator for ideas that aren't fully formed, a birthing center for developing work that you haven't started yet. A lot of artists worry that being online will cause them to make less work. But I've found that having a presence online is a kick in the pants. Most websites and blogs are set up to show posts in reverse chronological order. The latest post is the first post that visitors see. So you're only as good as your last post. This keeps you on your toes, keeps you thinking about what you can post next. Having a container can inspire us to fill it. Whenever I've become lost over the years, I just look at my website and ask myself, what 
can I fill this with? Liz Lamoureux, in her book, Inner Excavation, did an artist spotlight on Annie Lockhart. Here's a glimpse into how Annie sees herself. Who are you? I am like a silver transparency catching the light. I am like a mellow shadow tracing lines of richness. I am like a dreamy song tattered in laughing colors. I am like a season of changing choices written in red. I am like a nourishing anchor dancing in the wind. I am like a tangible boundary in unknown territory. I am like a subtle stone of strength in the river riverbed. I am like a blend of anticipation learning from the unexpected. Who or what inspires you? My inward journey began so long ago, and it seems like it's a never-ending one. One that I try desperately to keep my heart open to whenever someone new crosses my path. There are so many individuals that touch my life who have inspired me along the way. My grandmother, for one, has been an immeasurable source of strength and inspiration to me. She's hard to top, but several years ago, I, along with thousands of others, felt the tug of The Call by Araya Mountain Dreamer. I'm also inspired by poem, by the poem Desiderata by Max Ehrman, as well as any work by David Henry David Thoreau. I'm also a fan of children books, children's books because they keep me seeing life from a child's eyes. How do you nurture yourself? Whenever I need to nurture myself, I turn to nature. Anything to do with stepping out into the elements has always been a healing had a healing effect on me. Water being my number one choice. So I get to the ocean as often as I can. I am humbled beyond belief in her presence and power. I feel part of the universe, connected to love, when I choose to open these gifts of wonderment. Photographing nature is something that I do for myself as well. Looking through the viewfinder nudges me to see even the simplest weeds in a new light. How did you find your creative voice? I feel lucky that my creative voice actually found me at a very early age. I've not ever known a time when I didn't need or want to create. Having a creative grandmother helped, and having a mother who was not creative also helped. I mean that in a good way. Those early observations laid a groundwork for how I wanted to live. I'm finding that listening to and acting upon your creative voice is a choice. There were times that I didn't want to listen to what it was saying. My critics stepped in many times to discourage me. But creativity is a wonderfully funny thing. It can take on its own life. I am by nature an all-or-nothing kind of gal. When I jump into something, I sometimes have blinders on to the world around me. Not always good, such as when I was raising five small children. I'm finding that choosing to live a creative life is a lesson of balance, and I'm still working on this balance.